In this video, we're going to talk about computing the volumes of what we call solids of revolution. A solid of revolution is obtained by rotating a region in the xy plane about an axis. Usually we rotate about the x-axis or the y-axis, but you can rotate about any axis. Let's look at a simple example. If the region bounded by the semicircle that you see here, y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared, and the x-axis is rotated about the x-axis, then the solid of revolution produced is a solid sphere having radius 2. So in the picture, you can see the region in question. There's a semicircle on top and the x-axis. These bound a region, which is shaded here. If we rotate this about the x-axis, we're going to get a sphere. A sphere of having radius 2. So let me just attempt to draw in the bottom half of this, something that looks roughly speaking like that. And the idea is that we're spinning around, we're rotating around this region. So you imagine that it leaves a trail. Everywhere that the region goes, it leaves some solid remain of itself. So this point, for example, as it spins around, it generates this curve. And as it goes back around, it generates the other side. So perhaps since it's behind the sphere, we'll draw it like this. And it does this everywhere. And this region generates a, small, a solid object. It's called a solid of revolution. Well, it's solid because it's a solid object, but it's a solid of revolution because if you revolve this object around the x-axis, then you get something which does not change. You're rotating the region about the x-axis, but once you do that, you get this solid object which revolves around the x-axis and doesn't change when it does so. That's why it's called a solid of revolution. Let's look at another example. Here we have a triangular region, which is why we're calling it T. So let T be the region in the first quadrant bounded by y equals 2x and y equals 6. So y equals 2x is this straight line here, and y equals 6 is this horizontal line right here. So what we're going to do now is rotate this region about the y-axis. And if we do that, we should end up with a region that looks, roughly speaking, like this. And we're rotating, so it's going to have something like that. So we're going to have a cone. Let me just get rid of this y equals 6 up here. Let me just draw these curves back in. So the top of this cone is a circle. It's a circle having radius 3. And the height, as you can see, is 6. So this is a cone. We, what we want to do is we want to find a way of computing the volume. We already know the volume of a cone, but we want to find a technique that we can use for any solid of revolution. And we already have one. The basic principle of volume that we discussed before is that if a solid region lies between two planes, and in this case it lies between y equals 0 and y equals 6, and if the area of the cross-section at y is known, then the volume of the solid can be obtained by integrating the volume of the cross-section. In this particular case, we want to choose a y, and we want to find a horizontal cross-section our horizontal cross-section will be a circle. In fact, it'll be a disk. It's a solid disk. That is, it's full. A circle is empty. A disk is full. So what we have here is we have a disk. And so in fact, this is really a, a disk as well. So I shouldn't call it a circle. I should call this a disk. So the question then becomes, 
what is the area of that disk? Because if the area of the disk, so if the area of the disk at y is a of y, then we can compute the volume by just simply integrating the area. We integrate the cross-sectional area over y. We're using y because these are horizontal cross-sections. So that means you get a different one for each y value. Each different y value will give you a different cross-section, and that cross-section will have its own area. So we're adding up, so to speak, all of the different cross-sectional areas to get the total volume. So when you do this, you have to add up from the smallest y value to the largest y value. When we say add up, there are uncountably many, and if you have a summation, or if you're adding together an uncountable number of things, you do that using an integral. The smallest y value is as far down on the graph as you can go, which is at zero. This thing is bounded, this, this shape is bounded by two planes. In this case, the first one is y equals zero. And what about the second one? Well, the second one is y equals six, because that's the top here. We were told that. T was the region in the first quadrant bounded by y equals two x and y equals six. So y equals six tells us how high up we can go. So that means we're integrating from zero to six. The only thing that remains is to figure out what the surface area is for each y. And how are we going to do this? Well, notice that for that fixed y, it's the x value. This point on the curve right there has coordinates x and y. Now we fix the y. The y is fixed, but that tells us what the x is going to be. As long as you know what the y is, you know what the x is. Y, or I should ask, how do we know that? We know that because we know this formula right here. Y equals 2x. Y equals 2x is the relationship between x and y on this curve, which is a straight line. So as long as you're looking at a point on that curve, on that straight line, the relationship between y and x is that y is equal to 2x. So what does that mean? That means x is equal to y over 2. That's the same thing. We know what y is. We fix the y. We fix the y. And that tells us exactly what the x is. The x on the curve is y over 2. That's important to us because this x value is the radius of the circle. That is to say, it's the radius of the disk. We want to find the area of the disk. And the area of the disk is going to be pi r squared. But r is the radius, which you see right here. That's the radius of the disk. That radius is x, but x is equal to y over 2. So that tells me that the area is pi times r, which is y over 2, quantity squared. So now we have the area. So that means we can compute the volume. The volume of the cone is v equals the integral from 0 to 6 of the area, which is pi times y squared over 4. y over 2 quantity squared is y squared over 4 dy. And this is something we can evaluate using the power rule. So we have a pi. y increase the exponent by 1 and divide by that new exponent. Well, we've already got a 4 down there. So 4 times 3 is 12. And this is from 0 to 6 equals 6 cubed times pi over 12. And that's your answer. Or if you prefer, if you want to simplify this, that's 18 pi. And that's the volume of this 
cone. The key idea is this basic principle of volume that we used. We found cross-sectional areas for each y value, and then we integrate with respect to y to get the volume. Let's do another example. Here we have the solid region obtained by rotating about the y-axis. So again, we're going to rotate about the y-axis. The region we're going to rotate is this region here. This region in the first quadrant is bounded by y equals x squared over 4, which is a parabola, and y equals 4. So that means that the height here is at 4. So that's how high we are. So our solid region is going to be between z y equals 0 and y equals 4. This other curve is a parabola, y equals x squared over 4. And this is the region that we're going to rotate about the y-axis. And that's going to give us a parabolic object. It's called a paraboloid. It's like it's bowl-shaped, but this is a solid object. It, it's, not, it's not a bowl because it's not empty. This whole thing is completely filled. Now our objective here is to compute the volume, and what we're going to do again is we're going to find cross-sectional areas, and then we're going to integrate those cross-sectional areas. The first thing you need to determine is what direction you're going. Do you want to take vertical slices or horizontal slices? So the basic rule is that your cross sections are perpendicular perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So in this case, we're rotating about the y-axis, which is vertical. So in this example, we rotate about a vertical axis. So the cross sections are horizontal. Basically, the idea is that the alternative is too difficult to deal with. If you wanted to take cross-sections perpendicular to the x-axis, you would just end up with something which is a little too difficult to deal with. Because what would this region look like? It would look something like this. And you'd have to figure out what the area of that object was. It can be done, but it's just a little bit more difficult than what we want to do. So instead, we're going to pick a y value, and we're going to find a horizontal cross-section for that fixed y. So for each y, we're going to have an area. So that means y is fixed. So we're going to slice through here like this, and that's going to give us another disk. And what we want to do is we want to find the area of that disk. So it looks like that. So we're going to call the area of this thing A of Y. That's the area of the disk. At height Y. Now since it's a disk, and because it's a disk, this is sometimes called the disk method, we just need to find the area of that disk, which amounts to finding the radius, because the area is going to be pi times the radius squared, where we just have to figure out what the radius is. In this particular example, the radius is the length of this line segment that goes from the y-axis to this curve, y equals x squared over 4. Like in our last example, we can give this coordinates x comma y. And if you do that, then this length from 
the y-axis to the curve is the x-coordinate, because that's what the x-coordinate measures. It measures how far to the right you go until you get to the curve. So the radius here is x. So it's x squared. But of course, we're trying to integrate here with respect to y. So the volume is the integral of the area for each y cross-section, dy. You're integrating the area of the cross-section that you get for each y. And we can also put our limits of integration in now, because the smallest our y can be is down here at the bottom, which is a 0. And the tallest we can be is up at 4. So the integral goes from 0 to 4. So what we need to do is, it's not enough to say that the volume is equal to the integral from 0 to 4 of pi times x squared dy, because we're integrating with respect to y. The value of x depends on y, so we need to plug in what x is in terms of y. And again, we get that from our equation here. So we see that on that curve, whenever you have a point with coordinates x comma y, the relationship between x and y is given by y equals x squared over 4. So what does that tell you about x in terms of y? Well, y is equal to x squared over 4. So you can multiply that 4 over 4y equals x squared. And now you can compute the square root. So x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 4y. Now in this particular case, x is positive. The, the negative x value is over here on the other side. We're only looking at this side here. So we only need the positive square root. So in that case, x is equal to the positive square root of 4y. That's what we want. And we're going to put that in there. Of course, the square root of 4 is 2, but we don't need to work that hard because v is the integral from, let me just fix that integral symbol, the integral from 0 to 4 of pi times x quantity squared. So it's the square root of 4y quantity squared dy. So that's the integral from 0 to 4 of pi times 4y. The square root squared just gives you the thing underneath the radical dy. So that means we have 4 times pi times the integral from 0 to 4 y dy. We use the power rule y squared over 2 from 0 to 4 and that's going to give us that 2 will cancel with that 4 and just leave us with the 2. So it'll be 2 pi times 4 squared. So it's 32 pi. In the examples we've seen so far, we've been rotating around the y-axis, but you can also rotate around the x-axis. So let's do an example like that. So here we have a region R, which is a region in the first quadrant bounded by x cubed equals y times 8, or 8y, and x equals 2y squared. We want to determine the volume of the solid region obtained by rotating R about, this time, the x-axis. So our region is this region right here. And we want to rotate this around the x-axis. So this region is going to look a little bit different. Now, you don't need to graph the solid object, and I have no intention of graphing the solid object. In order to get some idea of what the volume is, really all we need are the cross-sections. So I'm just going to draw in a cross-section. Now, in order to do that, I need to have some information. So I'm going to draw in the mirror image of this object, or at least I'm going to try to do so. So it's going to look something like, something like this. Something like that. Now I'm rotating the whole region. I'm rotating this whole region about the x-axis. So it's going to appear over here as well, but it's going to appear everywhere in between. So I'm going to draw this as well, like that. Let me just try that one more time. So it's going to look something like this. OK, now it looks, this looks a little bit like a bowl, but on its side. Now this one is not solid all the way through. This is the rim 
this right here, this is the rim of the bowl. But there, it is not, there is no, there is no solid cover here. So if I draw this in, it looks solid, but it's not like that. It's, I can't quite say hollow, because there is some solid part to it, namely here. However, this region right here is open, so you could stick your hand in there. Since it's sort of like a bowl, you could put something in it, but it's on its side, so everything would fall out. But the idea is you could put your hand in there, and you could put, uh, put some object in here. So it's sort of like a bowl, but not the typical bowl that you would use to have your cereal in, for example. Okay, so how are we going to compute how are we going to compute the volume of this object? Well, just like we did before, we're going to use cross sections. But remember, our cross sections need to be perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Here we're rotating around a, a horizontal axis. So our cross sections are going to be vertical. So we're going to use vertical cross sections. That means I'm going to choose an x. So I'm going to pick an x value and then I'm going to do a cross section perpendicular to the x-axis. So it's going to look something like this. So it's going to intersect here, so that's why I'm drawing it with a solid line. The dotted line, it doesn't intersect anything because the bowl isn't there. But we have a solid line here. And we're rotating this around the x-axis, so we're going to get something circular. So it's going to look like this. So it's going to look something like that. Now this region is not a disk. It's a disk with a hole in the middle, which is a hole that's disk-shaped. So this is sometimes called a washer. So this is sometimes known as the washer method because we're using washers instead of disks. So let me just write, this is a washer, which is a disk with a hole in it. A disk-shaped hole in the middle. So we're going to give this area equal to a, but now it depends on which x we pick. So if I pick an x close to the origin, it's going to be small, like so. It's still going to be a washer, but it's going to just have a small hole in it. If you pick an x which is close to 2 here, this thing is going to have, you know, it's going to have a huge hole, as you can see. So at 2, it's just a circle. That is a circle without anything inside of it. If you move slightly to the left of 2, you'll have a little bit of thickness there, but it'll be quite small. But it'll be a giant hole in the middle. So your area depends on which x you pick. Now notice that it's no longer the area of a circle. You have a circle around the outside, but you're removing a circle from in, from in the middle. So you're going to remove a circle. So it's going to be the area of the big circle. And from that, you're going to subtract the area of the small circle. So that means you need to figure out what the areas of these are. So the area of the big circle is going to be pi times r squared, and I'm going to use a big R to represent the radius of the big circle, minus pi times r squared, but I'm going to use a lowercase r to represent the radius of the small circle. So in our picture, let me just change the color here. So hopefully this will stand out. So little r is this length right there. Little r is this length. And then big R is this length, all the way to the x-axis. So that's capital R. 
So we're measuring these radius, these radial lines, and these are the distance from the x-axis up to one of the curves. Little r is the distance from the x-axis up to this first curve. So that means in order to find the length of r, we need to figure out what that y corresponding y value is. The point here is x comma y. We fixed our x value, and our y is how high up we are, how high up we are on this curve. Now, in order to know that, we need to figure out what which curve that is. We have two curves. We have an x cubed equals 8y, and we also have an x equals 2y squared. So we need to figure out which curve is which. Now, x equals 2y squared, that's a parabola. That's a parabola lying on its side. So that's this one right here. This is x equals 2y squared. Or, if you prefer, y is equal to the square root of x over 2. So that's a parabola on its side. This other one is a cubic. x equals, or rather x cubed equals 8y. Or, if you prefer, this one is y equals x cubed over 8. That's, that's this one right here. That's this one. So, there's not really enough room for me to write it in clearly, but let's just do it like this. y equals x cubed over 8. So that's this one right there. Okay, so you can see the bottom curve is the cubic. So the curve, the equation of the curve, tells you the relationship between x and y. So in order to find how high up we are, so we're looking at this x right here, we want to find how high we are. That means the y value on this curve, but that's x cubed over 8. So that tells me that the small radius is x cubed over 8. What about the big radius? Well, the big radius is how high we are to, up to the top curve. So we're fixing this x value, then we're going to go all the way up to this top curve. So we need to know what the y value is there, because that tells us how high up we are. That's exactly what the y value tells you. It tells you how high you are above the x-axis. And that's exactly what our large radius is. You see, our large radius is over here. It's this length. I've written it over here, but it's this length right here. Okay, And so that tells us that we need to figure out what y is. But we have the relationship right there. y is equal to the square root of x over 2. So that's capital R the square root of x over 2. So, putting all of this together, we see that the area for each x is pi times capital R, which is the square root of x over 2, quantity squared, minus pi times the little radius, x cubed over 8, quantity squared. So that gives us our cross-sectional area. So the volume is going to be the integral of ax dx. We still need to figure out what our limits of integration are. So we need to find our smallest x to go here, our smallest x value, and we need our largest x value to go on the top. Actually, I'm just going to change the color here to black. So our largest x value here. Now in order to to determine these x values, well, let's look at our picture. Our smallest x value is how far to the left we can go. Our smallest x value is 0, right there. Well, it appears to be 0. We'll, we'll show that it is in a moment. Our largest x value is how far to the right we can go. And how far to the right we can go actually turns out to be 2. But notice it's the points of intersection. The farthest left we can go is a point of intersection, and the farthest right we can go is also a point of intersection. So we need to figure out what the points of intersection are. So to find limits of integration, we find the points of intersection.
Now, to do that, we just set them equal to each other in the sense that we have that both x and y must be the same at a point of intersection. So our curves are x cubed equals 8y and x equals 2y squared. And the whole idea here is that a point of intersection has the same x and y values. So that means in these two equations, we're looking for the xy's where they're both true at the same time. So for example, if we solve this one for y like we did before, we say that y is equal to the square root of x over 2. We already found that over here, or over here, depending on where you want to look. So now I can just take that and I can plug that in right to here, because they have the same y value at the point we're looking for. So we have x cubed equals 8 times y is the square root of x over 2. So let's square everything. So if you square everything, you're going to have x to the 6 equals 64 times x over 2, which is 32x over 1. 64 divided by 2 is 32. All right. So I let, let my next example slip a little bit there. So let's factor this. So x to the 6 minus 32x equals 0. So factor out an x, and you get x to the 5 minus 32 equals 0. So that means that x is either equal to 0, or x to the 5 equals 32. And x to the 5 equals 32 means x is equal to 2. So that means we get our x equals 0 and x equals 2 limits of integration. So that means that the volume is the integral from 0 to 2 of ax dx. But we know what ax is. It's right here. So that means the volume is the integral from 0 to 2 of pi times the square root of x over 2. Well, that should be the square root of x over 2 like that. Well, actually, we're squaring it. So the square root of x over 2, quantity squared, is just x over 2. And over here, this is x to the 6 over 64. So why don't we just write it in like that? So we're going to have pi times x over 2 minus pi x to the 6 over 64 dx. And this is our answer here. In the interest of time and the fact that I've run out of space, I'm not going to actually evaluate this, but we evaluate to get the volume. And notice that everything here is just power rule. This is going to be x squared over 2, and this one is going to be x to the 7 over 7. And then, of course, you have all of these other constants in there. But that's your answer in integral form, in definite integral form. Evaluate it to get the volume. So let's look at one more example. Now, this is actually the same region that we were just looking at. But this time, let's determine the volume of the solid region obtained by rotating r about not the x-axis, but the y-axis. So what's this going to look like? Well, again, let me change to blue. So we're going, we have the same points of integration here. Uh, the points of integration, or not integration, the points of the intersection are 0, 0, and this point where x is equal to 1, x is equal to 2, and y is actually equal to 1. So we found, we found those points of intersection last time. So now what we're doing is we're rotating about the y-axis, which is here. So let's just draw in this shape as best we can. So it's going to look something sort of like a petal shape. So it's going to look something like that, almost as if I'm trying to draw a flower. That's not a perfect replica, but we get the idea. And it's going to be like that. And again, this is a very similar shape to the one that we had before. It's not quite the same, but it's very similar. And this is, this is an open top bowl that just has very, very oddly thick um, base here. 
So the base is, has some thickness to it, which is very oddly shaped. But it's a bowl that you could put stuff in. Unlike the other bowl, which was on its side, you could put stuff in here without worrying about it falling out. So anyway, what we want to do is, again, we want to find cross-sectional areas. We're rotating about a vertical axis, so our cross-sections are now going to be horizontal. So that means you pick an x value, say down here, and you get cross sections. Well, let's let's pick it just a little bit higher. Let's right about here. It gives us a little bit more room to work with. So we're going to cross. We're going to choose a y value, and then have cross sections which are horizontal. So we're going to go like this. Now the solid part is where it's intersecting the solid object. These dotted lines here, that's where your horizontal cross-section is not intersecting the bowl. And then we're just going to draw our circles like this. So again we have a washer, a disk with a hole in the middle, a disk with a disk removed. So this is our region. Let me just fill it in. This is our cross-section. So as I said, it's a, it's a washer. It has a hole in the middle. It's a disk with a disk removed. Now notice that the shape of this thing, well, the shape is always a disk with a disk removed, but the actual size, the actual area, depends on which Y you pick. So the area of this thing is going to be, so the area is A, of y. It's, it depends on y, so it's a function of y. And again, the area of this y, uh, the area of this region for this y, is going to be the large disk, which we'll call, which has area pi capital R squared, minus the area of the small disk, which is pi little r squared. So again, let's just mark these. Let me just change the color to something more visible. So this, this length right here, that's little r, and then the bigger radius we're going to call capital R, like so. So pi times big R squared, this is the area of the big disk. Put the i and the s in the wrong order. And then pi little r squared, this is the area of the small disk. So now what we want to do is figure out what, what those radii are. And again, they're measuring the distance from an axis to the curve, but now they're measuring the distance from the y-axis to the curve. And that's actually going to be our x-coordinate. So for little r, your coordinates are x comma y, and for your big R, your coordinates are again x comma y. But these aren't the same x value. They're the same y value, but they're not the same x value. How do you figure out what they are? Well, you use the equations for the curves once again. So, the top curve, we remember, was the parabola on its side. So the top curve was x equals 2y squared. And the bottom curve was the cubic, which is x cubed equals 8y. What we're looking for this time are the x values. y is the same for both. y is the same for both. We just need to figure out what the x values are in terms of y. Well, the first one's already done for us. The, the parabola is already given to us as x in terms of y. So the parabola that's this curve right here, that's going to give us little r because we're measuring the distance from the y-axis to the parabola. The vert, the, we're, we're measuring the horizontal distance, and the horizontal distance is the x value, so it's 2y squared. So that's going to give us little r. So little r is equal to 2y squared. And big R is going to be the horizontal distance to the cubic, which is here, this one. So we're measuring this whole distance there. And that is given by this equation. But again, we need to solve for x. So solve for x. 
but that's just taking the cube root. So it's going to be 8y to the 1 third. Well, the cube root of 8 is 2. So we can write this as x equals 2y to the 1 third. And that's our capital R, 2y to the 1 third. So now we can compute the area of y, which is pi times capital R, 2y to the 1 third, quantity squared, minus pi times little r, which is 2y squared. That's supposed to be a y, quantity squared. And our volume is going to be equal to, well, let me write it like this. Our volume is v, which is the integral of a y dy. And our smallest y value is, again, 0. But our largest y value, that's how high up we can get. That's going to be, that's going to be 1. So our integral goes from 0 to 1. So our volume is the integral from 0 to 1 of a of y, which we know it's pi times 2y to the 1 third quantity squared, minus pi times 2y squared quantity squared dy. Of course, you can simplify this. It's the integral from 0 to 1 of pi times 4y to the 2 thirds minus pi times 4y to the 4th dy. And once again, this is the answer in terms of a definite integral. Let's just put a little box around it and call that good. So in order to find the volume, you actually just want to evaluate. So evaluate to get the volume. And once again, in the interest of time, I won't actually do it. But you can see that, again, it's power rule just for both of these pieces. So this is a definite integral where you use the power rule to compute the antiderivatives or to compute antiderivatives. And that will give you the volume.